Welcome everyone to the Q&A session for our upcoming course, Liberating Your Authentic Writing Voice, Seven Essential, essential Steps from Creation to Completion. I'm Lisa Bonnese, and I'm really jazzed about this Q&A conversation for the Shift Network, where we'll chat with Mark Matusik and address questions about his upcoming seven-week course, Liberating Your Authentic Writing Voice, which begins Wednesday, January 9th. Later, I'll explain how you can participate in this course, even if you can't attend the live sessions. But first, I want to introduce our guest. Mark Matusek is a best-selling author and teacher whose work focuses on personal awakening and creative excellence through self-inquiry and life writing. His first book, Sex, Death, Enlightenment, A True Story, became an international bestseller and was published in 10 countries and nominated for two books for a Better Life Awards. He's contributed to numerous publications, including The New Yorker, The New York Times Magazine, Harper's Bazaar, The Saturday Evening Post, and many others. Mark is on the faculty of the Omega Institute for Holistic Studies and the New York Open Center, teaching transformational writing workshops around the U.S. and in Europe. And in just a few minutes, we're going to open up for our viewers' questions. But first, I want to welcome Mark, who will begin our call by leading us in a writing exercise. Welcome, Mark. It is so great to actually see you this time instead of talking on the phone. It's great to see you, Lisa, finally, after all these years. Yeah. Welcome, everyone. I'm glad you could join us for this, uh, for this Q&A session. We're going to begin by doing a six-minute writing exercise. And the purpose of this exercise is to prompt your mind and imagination for the rest of the call. So if you wouldn't mind, please, taking out uh, something to write with, or if you write on your computer, that's absolutely fine. We're going to take six minutes now to describe the thing in you that you most want to create. Okay, forget about logistics, forget about uh, practicalities. The thing in you that you would most like to create, if you can. Okay, describe it as in as much detail as possible, why it matters to you, and who you would be speaking to or, or um, helping with this piece of work or this message. Okay, so we'll begin now. We'll take six minutes to do that. Uh, begin now. Thank you. Four more minutes, please.
Two more minutes, please. Thirty more seconds. Let's start to finish up. Okay, let's come back together as a group. So Lisa, we can continue now with the, uh, with the Q&A. All right, great. Thank you, Mark. Uh, so we have the rest of our time together to dive into our audience's questions for Mark as we prepare for his upcoming course. Again, that's called Liberating Your Authentic Writing Voice, and it begins Wednesday, January 9th. And if you want to check out the website and learn more about the seven-week course, you can visit writingvoicecourse.com to see the full description. So let's go ahead and get started. If you have a question for Mark, go ahead and type your questions in. I'll be happy to read them aloud. In the meantime, we've got some questions that have already been submitted. Uh, so let's go ahead and do uh, something here from Charles. Charles says, I've hit the 90-year-old mark this year. How can I keep myself fired up and inspired to write every single day? Well, Charles, what works for me and for a lot of the writers I know uh, is to ask yourself, what are the questions that are up for you in this moment? What is your growing edge? What's your creative edge? What do you want to discover? What are you curious about? Because it's curiosity, obviously, that keeps us young, which you must know if you're in this uh, Q&A session uh, at 90 years old. You're someone who wants to continue growing. Uh, the way to do that is to continue the practice of self-inquiry. So by asking ourselves, what is the deep truth for us in this moment, the messy human momentary truth, uh, we go deeper into what it is that matters to us, which then leads us into what we might want to create. So Charles, that's what I would recommend doing is in the morning, ask yourself a question, something that's up for you, whether it's about relationships or health or creativity or government or whatever, or spirituality or whatever it might be and see where it takes you. Even 15 minutes uh, a day of this kind of deep writing, Charles, uh, has proven a psychological as well as physical benefits. So I recommend that you give it a try. Okay, thank you for that. Oh, we've got a question here from Susan who says, how do you know if you're going to be a writer? That's a good question, Susan. You know, people have this idea that writers are another breed. Uh, and while it's true that some writers are eccentric uh, and, and build up a kind of literary persona for themselves, uh, anyone who has the ability to put words together uh, into thoughts and thoughts together into stories, uh, can write. Whether you're a writer with a capital W uh, is, is, a, is another story. If you're going to be a career writer, that's quite another story. 
But if you're somebody who wants to write for your own erudition, uh, to to write books or, or essays or other things for others you know, to read, uh, without relying on it for your living, Susan, uh, then you can call yourself a writer now. If you're somebody who likes to put pen to paper, who likes to express yourself in words, uh, you're a writer. Uh, and, and this idea that one has to be some special person to be a writer uh, is, is simply not true. And very much what this course is about dispelling. We have gifts in us that we want to express. We have messages in us that want to be heard. There are people in the world that we want to communicate to. Writing is one excellent way of doing that. And of course, today we have so many uh, media for, for doing that in, Susan. So the beauty is uh, anyone who is, uh, has the desire to connect can connect. That's a great gift. So call yourself a writer. Give yourself that confidence. Uh, and... I'm interested to know more. I hope that I can hear more from you uh, at some time about what it is that you want to write. So thanks, Susan. All right. Thank you, Mark. Uh, let's go to a question here from Joseph. We've actually got three questions on this topic. People who watched your original conversation with Stephen Dynan, uh, you were talking about taboos. And Joseph asks, what's an example of a taboo? I'm not sure what you're referring to. Oh. Uh, Joseph, well, a taboo is something that is that is forbidden uh, by the culture, the family, uh, the group uh, in which you live. Uh, and different groups have different kinds of taboos. In Saudi Arabia, it's taboo for a woman to show her leg. In this country, it's taboo for uh, relatives to to uh, to have uh, sexual relations. With there are taboos uh, in different cultures that uh, reflect that culture's values. So what, ask yourself what it is, Joseph, that you are most ashamed of in your life, or what scares you, where do you feel like you can't go for whatever reason, uh, and those very likely are connected to the taboos in the culture that you, you find yourself. Uh, and we, we all have them. So they're the off-limits parts of ourselves that we put into the psychological shadow. And one of the great things about creative work is that it often comes from the shadow. It comes very frequently from the wound uh, that gives rise to the need for expression. So often our gifts come directly out of our wound, which is why it's so important to, uh, to go into the areas that we feel are taboo or scary. First of all, we realize that they're not as scary as we thought that they were. Uh, and second of all, we open our minds and we allow ourselves to see things from, uh, some, from a larger perspective, which necessarily makes us more awakened human beings, more creative uh, and uh, daring writers, uh, and, and people who are not uh, so scared of their own shadow. You know, a lot of folks spend their lives running from their own shadow. And we do that for a lot of valid self-protective reasons, but it doesn't lead to a, a fulfilling life. Uh, of creativity, of growth, of personal evolution. And we have, to, we have to challenge our fears in order to grow, as I'm sure you know, Joseph. And that's what taboos are all about. That's why it's important to look at them square in the eye and say, what are you made of? What am I actually scared of here? Or is this just a story that I inherited from my folks or from, from my uh, society that really has no bearing on my authentic moral life? It's important to ask ourselves what really matters to us. Is it taboo to you or is it simply taboo uh, because it always has been and it's time to retire uh, that, particular, uh, that particular fear? So, Joseph, I hope that helps. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, let me go ahead and follow up with the other questions there since we're on this topic. Uh, you've sort of touched on the answers. Uh, Tammy asks, can you give an example of a taboo and a shameful response to it? And then Susan wants to know, are there any particular writing prompts that help to explore taboos when journaling? Sure, Tammy, first, uh, first of all, let me give you this example. It just came up for a student of mine. Uh, she's a, an Indian woman who was raised in a culture where uh, the man was meant to support the female. In her particular relationship, she is supporting her husband, and it causes her great shame and confusion. It is a taboo for the woman to be the breadwinner. 
And so while it's okay in their marriage, more or less, uh, socially, it's not all right. She's judged for it. Uh, he is criticized for it. Uh, and their response to this shame, to this taboo, uh, is to withdraw from many of the people in their lives whom they love, uh, but don't want to have to keep convincing that the way they're living is, is, is okay. So that's one, that's one um, example. And what was the second question, Lisa? Uh, the second question was, oh, are there any particular writing prompts that help to explore taboos when journaling? Yes, absolutely. The, the one that I always recommend is, what are you most afraid of? What is it that truly scares you? That's going to lead you into a whole, into a whole field of taboos. So, so, so ask yourself, here is the key uh, to, that opens the door of the shadow. So, so by identifying our fears, we free ourselves from them. We give ourselves, as I was saying before, perspective on them. Uh, and and that, that's what takes us deeper uh, through the fear so that we can look at it and, and realize that it, we are bigger than it is. And fear is always a story. Aside from direct, imminent physical attack, which that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the other 99.9% percent of the time when we're creating fear with our mind. Fear comes from a narrative. So by discovering the narratives around our own fears, we free ourselves from those narratives. I like to say that when you tell the truth, your story changes. And when your story changes, your life is transformed. Uh, and that's what happens when we're honest uh, and brave about self-investigation and serious about healing ourselves. This, is, this has a lot to do with wanting to become integral, wanting to become whole, wanting to become comprehensive, people in the round. And in order to do that, we need to gently, but diligently, work on the limitations of our own fears. Okay, great. Thank you so much for that. Uh, let's uh, move uh, into a question here from Tricia, who says, I've been researching for many years for a book I intend to write, and I feel like I'm done with the research, but I'm having a hard time switching gears into writing mode. Will your course help me with this? Yes, Tricia, it, it, it will. And, and, and this, is, this is a great example of how people can get stuck in their own process. Uh, I know folks who have done nonfiction books who simply couldn't let go of the research and couldn't stop reading weren't convinced that they ever knew quite enough, and, know, and were never able to, to quite get to the writing. So ask yourself seriously, Tricia, have you read enough? Do you know what you need to know in order to do this project? Okay, that's one of the things that we'll be working on uh, in lesson three of this upcoming course, building the plan for how we're going to do it. And that means the chronology of tasks uh, between us and the completion of our own work. So you're going to ask yourself very honestly whether you know enough to write whatever it is that you need to write, or whether you're leaning on the research out of insecurity. Because in my experience, excessive research actually weakens the project. It can weaken the work. The, writer, the reader wants to know what you think. What do you bring that's original to the subject. Nobody wants to read a nonfiction work that is a bunch of quotations and references strung together, or a, uh, a congeries of, of other people's beliefs and other people's thoughts. We want to know what you think, what it meant to you. Okay, so allow yourself to step back, uh, ask yourself this question about, uh, about if there's anything more that you need to learn. If there is, then, then, then inform yourself. Uh, but don't delude yourself into thinking that there's ne that it's a never-ending process and that you'll never be ready. Uh, chances are uh, you are almost ready. I mean, you say, you say you've been doing research for a while. Chances are you're, right, you're almost ready, if not ready already. So, uh, yes, this course could actually could help you quite a lot, Church. Okay, great. Perfect. Thank you. Well, let's uh, go down that path a little further here. This is a question from Ranjini who says, what do you do to keep up the momentum to get past the resistance to embody the discipline of finishing a book? It's easy to start and make headway, but hard to bring something to completion. 
Yes, it is. And Rajini, that, that, that's the whole point of, of, of doing this, uh, this kind of, of a course, is that momentum is imperative, and there are so many things that can get in the way of our own progress. Uh, internal resistance, the, the logistics of our own lives, lack of structure. So for you, I would recommend uh, looking at the question of, of obstacles. What are they precisely? What are the exact obstacles in your life or in your own mind uh, to uh, completing your, your work? And then getting very clear about what can be worked with and how, and what is simply a, a figment of your imagination. And then once you're able to get yourself working again, I highly recommend sticking to it uh, at least five days a week. Even if you write a half hour a day, that's sufficient to keep the energy going. Because for every day that you take off, when you're really engaged with a piece of work, it's going to take two days to get back into it at least. If you take a week off, it's going to take two weeks to get back into it. Okay, so allow yourself to create a structure that is flexible enough to, to um, you know, make room for life's, you know, life's changes, but firm enough to stand on so that each day you're not thinking, am I going to work? You think you know you're going to work. Uh, it's a question of when and how. I also recommend Rajnini the, um, doing it uh, every day at the same time, if possible, uh, and in the same place, if possible. You know, I've been doing this about 35 years, and, and I'm kind of like a banker. I, I, I have my hours. They're very firm, and they allow me a great deal of creative freedom. You know, contrary to what that looks like from the outside, being rigid or kind of, you know, kind of um, too predictable, it's very liberating uh, for me as a writer to know that this is my sacred time. This is my sanctuary. This is my refuge. Come hell or high water, I'm going to be at my desk. And it's the same thing as a meditation practice. You know, we don't wait to be in a, a, a good mood or to feel peaceful before we sit down to meditate. Oh, bon frere. We sit down regardless, and then we discover what's there. And the same thing goes with writing. You can't do it unless you show up. You have to be present to play. So I recommend regularity. Uh, I recommend not, um, not creating unmeetable expectations. That's the other thing. Some folks say, oh, I'm going to write eight hours a day. Nobody writes eight hours a day. If you have two creative hours a day, you are way ahead of the game. If you have three, it's, it's miraculous. So, so this, these, this is the reality of, how, uh, of what happens in the writing process. And a lot of folks simply don't know that. And so they beat themselves up because they can't sit for, for more than a, a couple of hours uh, at, at their desk. A couple of hours is plenty as long as you keep showing up. And then the work develops its own moment. And your subconscious uh, is, becomes more creative because it knows there's space for it to express itself. That's the purpose of creating that container, that regular uh, writing period, so that the, the muse knows there's a place for her to show up. The muse doesn't want to show up if you don't make room in your life for her to, to, to bring her magic. So momentum uh, has a lot to do with creating the space uh, for writing to happen. Thanks for the question. All right, and thank you for the answer. And for those of you who are just joining us, we're here with Mark Matusek, learning about his upcoming course, Liberating Your Authentic Writing Voice, which begins Wednesday, January 9th. And you can log on to writingvoicecourse.com for all the details and to register. Let's go ahead and get back into questions here. Let's, let's reel it back a little bit for people who are just beginning this kind of work. Here's a question from Mona. I think she says it beautifully for everybody who feels this way. Mona just says, I don't know where to start. I've been writing poems and some thoughts for me and friends. I want to write, and I have the feeling and desire of writing, but I feel blocks are stopping me. Mona, I would venture to say it's not blocks, it's lack of clarity. And I would look, for example, carefully at what you wrote during today's exercise. What was the first thing that came up when I asked, what would you most like to do? That's a key. If you were not able to identify anything, then I would recommend that you ask yourself what, why you're afraid to know what. If there's a, a sense, perhaps, that if you know, then you're going to have to do it, and that scares you, so better not to know. Uh, so your mind is playing the game, telling you that you're not sure. So it, it, it's, not, it, it, it's not necessarily blocks, it's lack of clarity. 
uh, his lack of, of attention. And this course could be very, very useful for you, Mona, for exactly that reason. This is, this is all about choosing, which is something that we don't always do in the creative process. Nothing can happen until we make choices, but people are quite scared sometimes to make creative choices uh, and to, to declare that they're going to do a, a particular thing. It's a little bit like fear of commitment in relationships. You know, folks who, who won't commit in relationship uh, are very hard to bond with, hard to get intimate with, hard to make plans with. Uh, and, and the same thing goes with our own writing process. If we have commitment issues with our own writing process, if we're afraid to show up and declare ourselves and what it is that's, that, that's moving us, what we really truly want to do, but then we'll find all kinds of reasons um, to, to, be, to stay confused, to stay lost, to stay ambivalent. Uh, and ambivalence really is the one of the uh, major, um, one of the major culprits in the block of, of, of creativity. It's this sense of, of, oh, I could do this, I could do that. And we need to come to the place where we make choice, and that takes work and it takes focus. So that would be my recommendation to you, Mona, is to focus as much as possible on what it is that you uh, wrote about in the first six minutes of this, this session and see where it takes you. If you get quiet enough and listen deeply enough, you will know. But it does take time, and so I recommend doing it as regularly as possible. Thanks, thanks, Mona. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, we've got a question here from Karen. This is rather lengthy, so give me a second to read this out. Uh, Karen says, I've been a nurse for 45 years, 25 of them in hospice and home health. My experiences have been profound. Uh, lacking confidence that people would want to explore these tender spaces, my stories remain in my binders. I've shared some of them on social media to see how they might be accepted and was met with a comment that gave me pause in my ability to communicate them. A dear friend who's an English professor said of my writing, you write the way you must speak. Why that stopped me, I'm unsure, but it did pause me and I wanna move past that. Do you have any advice? Karen, that's a good, uh, good question and a kind of a confusing comment. Sometimes it's said that we, we should aspire to write the way that we speak. In other words, with our own natural cadence, uh, our own particular tone, not trying to sound too academic or too kind of bland uh, and, and, and um, formal. So the idea of, of, of loosening up the writing voice and writing the way we speak naturally uh, is something that I have, uh, I have heard before and something that, that is quite good advice. I'm not at all sure what the person meant by saying that you, should, you write the way you should speak. So that's a bit confusing to me. And if you want to write to me privately, Karen, and, and clarify, I'll be happy to give you a, a clearer answer. But as for the tender, uh, heavy um, stories that you've encountered in hospice not being interesting to people or being intimidating uh, to people, I, I truly disagree. Uh, if you read the work of Rachel Naomi Remen, if you read the work of uh, Stephen Levine, if you read my book, When You're Falling Dive, which people have, have gotten a lot out of, uh, you'll see that people are hungry for gravitas. When we live in a world that doesn't allow a lot of room for gravitas. So provided the stories bring illumination, they bring some kind of wisdom, uh, they, there's, there's, you, you draw some, some insight from it. People are hungry for teaching stories of this kind, Karen. I wouldn't worry about that at all. But I would ask yourself, and it's worth investigating in writing, why you fear that people aren't ready for these stories. What is it you're worried about being judged for or, or rejected because of? And the, the last thing I'd say, Karen, is social media might not be the best medium uh, on which to share this kind of material. Perhaps you could share it with, a, with, with some like-minded people uh, in another form. So there, they, it comes out of a quieter, more reflective uh, and, and literary ambiance than reading it on your computer. I think that that has its own deleterious effects. So look at who you're sharing with, how you're sharing it, but trust that these stories matter. People want to have their hearts open. 
This is really important. As long as you bring intelligence to it and compassion uh, and, so, and something to take away. But it's not enough just to give people the, the bad news, the terrible diagnoses and the ugliness, obviously. We need, to, we need to also bring some kind of transformation, even if the transformation is within yourself. But thanks, Karen. Hey, thank you for that. Uh, I think this would be a good time to ask this as a follow-up question. Laura wants to know, what are some exercises to become more accustomed to and feel confidence in one's authentic voice? You know, I like to recommend that, Laura, that folks write about their desires. What do you truly desire in your life? Not just around creativity, uh, around love, uh, in terms of, of significance and having purpose in the world, in terms of spirituality. Uh, what are your passions? What are your desires? As you get come closer to those things, uh, your voice will begin to emerge because your enthusiasm will uh, begin to emerge. Remember, the word enthusiasm comes from the root fulfilled with God. The closer you get to your own enthusiasm, that, that vital current of a live curiosity and creativity, uh, the more natural and authentic your voice is going to be. So what is it that gives you joy? What is it that you feel passionate about? What do you most deeply desire? What moves you? What excites you? Uh, those are the kinds of questions to write about that will bring out the sound of your own unique, eccentric, particular voice. And remember that your voice is, can be as, as, as uh, unexpected as you want it to be. On the page, you can be whatever you want to be. You can use any of your, your many different tones and octaves on the page, depending on what it is you're writing and, and what it is you want to communicate. So go towards your desire, write about that, see what comes out for you, uh, and that will be a big part of the quality of your uh, authentic writing voice. Nice, thank you. Um, let's go to a question here from Dolores, who says, branding is important in today's world. Is it important to keep your audience in mind when you're writing your story or simply focus on the deep emotional truth? You know, Dolores, that's a complicated question. Both are true in the sense that when we write for a publication or to share with other people, uh, it becomes a dialogue important that we have a sense that we are dialoguing with an unknown other. However, we don't want the audience to encroach too closely on us when we are in the process of doing our first draft. So in the first draft, I would recommend focusing more on what's coming from inside than on worrying about telling a tale to somebody else. Uh, of course, it depends on what you're writing, but Generally, it's, it's a more internal experience, a more interior uh, journey, doing the first draft uh, of a piece of work. After that, we begin to craft it, we edit it, we shape it, and we target it in the sense of, of speaking to the ear of, of our, our ideal uh, listener. But in the first draft, don't worry too much about that. Remembering it's not just a monologue, but it's yours uh, in the first draft and doesn't have to be too tailored to other people's, uh, to other people's needs or, or expectations. And the reason that I say that, Dolores, is that a lot of folks uh, are prematurely concerned with what others are going to think, how it's going to be taken, uh, whether, some, whether it will lead to us being liked and approved of and, and, and loved. These are not the considerations to keep in mind when you're doing the first draft uh, of, a, of a piece of work because it, it requires your courage. It requires your, uh, your commitment to follow the, the work in the direction it wants to go rather than second guessing it. And a lot of folks do that in the desire to be popular or simply because they don't know any better. They're, 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 they're tap dancing for the crowd before they've actually found the dance for themselves. So find the dance for yourself, uh, and then you can start worrying about uh, uh, who's in the wings and whether, they, whether the sight lines are good and, and whether they can hear you in the back. Okay, Dolores, I hope that helps. All right, great, thank you. Uh, we do have time for a few more questions, but before we take those, I wanna go ahead and give a few details about the course itself. 
Uh, but first, let me answer a question here from Suzanne, who typed in uh, asking for Mark to repeat the writing prompt from today because she got on the call a little bit late and might have missed it. Suzanne, you'll be able to rewatch anybody else who missed it as well. Uh, the Facebook video will be able to be watched again many times. And if you're watching this on the Shift Network webcast, you will also you will receive a link in an email that will tell you how to go ahead and watch that again. So in the meantime, uh, let me give some details about the course. Once again, it's called Liberating Your Authentic Writing Voice. And this is going to be just a wonderful seven week journey uh, with Mark with his expert guidance, where you'll bring your unique story to fruition and share your core message of empowerment with others. And the seven week course takes place on Wednesdays at 5 p.m. Pacific, starting Wednesday, January 9th. And if you can't join us live, that's fine. You won't miss any of the teachings. You'll receive audio recordings, transcripts, and all course handouts on your course homepage. And also, I'd like to remind you that we offer a no-risk money-back guarantee on all of our courses, giving you a full two weeks until January 23rd in this case to make sure that you absolutely love it. We want you to be happy. Also, as an added option, all participants are welcome to, to connect in a private Facebook community group so you can stay connected with one another. Also, everyone who registers receives the Liberating Your Authentic Writing Voice bonus collection. First, you'll receive an audio teaching from Mark Matusek entitled, The Questions That Matter, The Art of Self-Inquiry. Next, you'll get an audio dialogue with Mark and Mark Nepo called, The One Life We're Given. Also, you'll receive another audio teaching from Mark Matusek, and this one is entitled, The Heart Has Its Reasons learning the language of emotions. So before we get back into the Q&A with our viewers, Mark, what are you most looking forward to sharing in your upcoming course? Thanks, Lisa. First, I'd like to say, Suzanne, the question that you missed uh, was, what is it in you that most wants to be expressed? If you could create anything at all, what would it be? Logistics aside, the practicalities aside, what is it that wants to come out of it? Uh, that's what I ask people to write about for six minutes. So it would be wonderful if you could uh, do that. I'm looking forward to this class, Lisa. As I said on the call with Stephen, uh, I wanted to teach a practical, hands-on writing lab uh, with Shift for a very long time. And finally, uh, finally, I'm able to do it in 2019. I have many students who come to me with fantastic ideas and no idea how to uh, how to do them. They just don't know where to start, as one of the folks said on, on today's call. And this is a class designed to give people a, a skeleton, so to speak, for how to move into their own uh, project through to completion. So it begins with finding your authentic voice, then we, uh, we uh, identify what it is specifically you want to create, then we look at structure, we look at work habits, we look at resistance, we look at discipline, and then we look at a few action steps at the end of the course that are going to carry you through uh, to the fruition of, of whatever your project happens to be. Uh, and this to me feels like a great opportunity for all of those people out there who, who have this, un, this unfinished thing, They're either unfinished because they haven't started or unfinished because they've gotten to a certain point and get stuck. And they really want to bring it into the world. Uh, but however, however wide, even if it's just for legacy to show to, to your own family. So I'm excited about this because I think it can be useful. It's not just self-inquiry, which is not a just, it's an important thing, but it's a never-ending thing. This course is about reaching uh, an end with what it is that you want to do. It's enormously satisfying to finish a piece of work and have it land. In, in a way that makes an impact, whether it's a, for a few people or, or for, for, uh, for a lot of readers. It, it's deeply, deeply satisfying, and I see too many people go without that experience. It's a little bit like being non-orgasmic. You know, you, you do it and you do it, and there's no final sort of uh, uh, the climax of release uh, in order to share with, with other people, which is what we want uh, at our cores to connect. So this class is going to help people connect to their own work and then let that work connect to uh, the wider world, which is why I'm so excited about this. Okay, great, thank you. Got a question.
question here from Jennifer that says, editors want to change the way I write something, but it's the way I would say it. What are your thoughts on this? After all, it's my story. Jennifer, that's a tricky question. I have been an editor and I'm also a writer. I'm a writer first. Uh, if everyone is telling you the same thing, Jennifer, chances are there's something there for you to hear or to look at. It doesn't mean you have to do it their way, uh, but it does mean that it's wise to, to hear what, what, what they're telling you. But having said that, I don't think it's necessary to change your work uh, according to one person's uh, opinion. And that's just their opinion. So either get a second opinion or don't get another opinion at all and just finish the project. Once the project is finished, then you, uh, you can ask for, uh, you can find uh, the, the right editor for yourself. But, but I've also seen people uh, kind of torpedo their own work because one person has said something damaging to them at a vulnerable moment and they were never able to get back on track again. Uh, and that's tragic particularly because it's only one person's opinion, and it's frequently wrong. I've come across that many times in my career of you know, working with people. They've gotten some bogus uh, advice or information from uh, someone and taking it to heart. Uh, it's become their, part of their story of, 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 of how, what a writer has to do, and they just don't feel capable of it, or they don't want to. As you're saying, this is your story, this is your voice, this is how you want to do it. Okay, so ask yourself honestly whether uh, there's something to what they're saying. Is there a consensus? Uh, are there, is there a kind of a refrain that you're hearing from a lot of people? And uh, if so, don't be afraid to make a, an adjustment. Remember, this is a conversation. It's not just for ourselves. Well, for example, uh, I used to write very, very long sentences. Uh, and I still like a long sentence, but they were too long. I would write sentences with six or seven clauses in them. And intelligent, well-meaning people I know uh, sort of told me in unison, this is confusing. It's too much. It, it, it's not Faulkner. You know, this is, this is something else. And uh, pull it back. Uh, let there be more breath, more, more pauses in the work. And so I started to do that. And I think that they were right. So I still have a natural bent to go on uh, and write a long Faulkner, Faulknerian or Proustian sentence, uh, but it doesn't actually work as well for the reader. So that was a, that was a great note, and I took it to heart. So uh, take what's useful and, and, and leave the rest. Okay, great. Thank you. Got a question here from Judith. Uh, this is about the course itself. She says, I'm not anywhere near skillful in the use of Facebook. Can you talk about how to participate in the Facebook group is this going to be a serious detriment to my taking the class if I don't understand Facebook? It won't be at all. I mean, the Facebook component of the class is, is optional, number one. Number two, it's actually quite easy. This is a secret Facebook group. You will have a link to go directly there, and, and it's not difficult. Uh, someone at Shift can absolutely walk you through it. So. I would hope you, you won't stay away from the class because of Facebook. Uh, you don't have to participate at all. And if you want to, Judith, uh, it might be a growth opportunity because it's, it's quite easy. I'm not a technological person and even I can use Facebook. So if I can do it, I think anybody. Great, thank you. Uh, let's uh, another question about the course itself. Devin says, what's the buddy feedback option? Is it a variation on the conference call at the end of the class, or is this something separate that we coordinate setting up with our designated buddy? And does, does this buddy stay the same or change from week to week? Good question, Devin. Thank you. Uh, the buddy stays the same throughout the course, uh, unless there is a conflict between you, in which case, of course, you have the option to change. And it's between you to set up the, um, the way you want to work together. You know, some people like to talk on the phone. Some people like to meet on Skype or on Zoom. Some people simply like to send their work to one another. So whatever it is your needs are and how they uh, jive with the others uh, will become the arrangement that you, that you create. And, of course, uh, Anne Lenahan, the course manager, will be there to 
to help folks who are having trouble finding a buddy or aren't uh, having a good experience with the buddy they're with. You can also, of course, write to me during the course and I'll do what I can. But it does help, particularly with a virtual course, to have some one-on-one time beyond the, the Q&A at the end of each session. Uh, so I hope that you'll join us, Devin, and I hope that you will, uh, you will take advantage of the buddy system. You can be very, very supportive uh, and, and helpful. Okay, great. Thank you. I've got a question here from Jill. It's a little lengthy, so give me a second here to read it. Uh, and you've sort of touched on this, but let's get personal with Jill. She says, I've had a book in mind for decades, and every once in a while I dabble in it, even though I have set plenty of time aside over the years to work on it. I don't know what's going to take for me to get going and truly commit the time and effort to it. I'm truly passionate about the topic. I have a title for it, but seemingly no ability to focus and prioritize. Yet I feel I would never forgive myself if I don't write it, and I feel what I have to say is worth writing about, and that there are readers who will want to read it. Do you have any advice for Jill? Jill, you are the person that this course was created for. It's the person who, who has a real calling to, to do something and truly doesn't know how to, how to, uh, how to continue. You know, what you said about not being able to forgive yourself if you didn't bring it out of you, that's what uh, a, a message uh, feels like inside us. It, it, we're, we're bursting with it. It needs to come out. So this course would uh, help you a lot to organize your own thinking, to clarify your vision, to create a structure for the work, to create a work plan for yourself, to make a reasonable and uh, flexible schedule, including a delivery schedule, and, and to just get clear on how you want to do it. Uh, Jill, it's, it's, it's quite common for us to avoid getting too close with what we want to create because it requires us to work. Uh, it, it, it's work. Uh, and it means making choices. And when you make one a choice, uh, you leave other things out. And that's something that a lot of folks have trouble doing. So it, it takes practice. And that's what you'll be doing in this class, is making creative choices and committing to creative choices uh, that will become your, your, your moors, uh, that will, that, that will uh, ground you as you move forward in, in the writing itself. And I'll be talking a lot during this class about what a reasonable deadline might be, how long things actually take, the nature of revision, which is, which is huge, uh, and other kind of pitfalls on, on the writing path that, uh, that I have come across, learned from experience, and also, also work with uh, students to, to overcome. So I hope you'll join us, Jill. Okay, thank you. I've got a question here from Anne who says, do you have any prompts or suggestions to access my fears so I can write what I'm afraid of? My fears are hiding themselves. Well, Anne, I, I find that fear is actually closer at hand and less hidden than we think it is when we avoid it. So the best possible prompt and exercise for you to do is to ask yourself, what are you afraid to know about your Why don't you want to know about your What is the resistance? What's your story about what would have to change uh, if you let that fear in? Or, or how you might respond if that uh, fear were to become conscious? There's resistance to getting close to the fear, which is why it can't shift. It can only change when you move through it. And that comes through inquiry. Uh, and focus and getting uh, specific about what it is that is uh, causing you anxiety or resistance. So the best thing to do is ask yourself, why are you afraid to know what you're afraid of? And that sounds a little woo-woo, but if you think about it, uh, write it down, think about it, uh, you will notice feelings coming up. And you don't have to have clear ideas, you don't have to have conclusions or any, or, or, or any kind of a thesis. You just have to know that when I think about doing that, my heart sinks. Or when I think about doing that, my legs get tense and I want to run. Or when I think about uh, my own fears, um, I get extremely depressed and, and, and shut down. What is the response uh, that comes up for you when, you when you try to confront your fears? That's going to give you clues as to how to move toward it 
uh, more skillfully uh, and eventually dispel it with awareness. Okay, thank you. Let's go to a question here from Kay who says, is the process for writing a children's book similar to writing one for adults? And additionally, if you had stops and starts within the process, is there a way to get back to the truth you first wrote with? Good question, Kay. I mean, it, sometimes when we put something aside for a very long time, uh, our interests change, our values change, our perspective change. And so the truth we started out with is no longer our truth. And that means starting from scratch. That means getting to the heart of what the story or this project means to you now. Um, so the, uh, but, but really consistency okay, is, is, the way to, is the way to alleviate that. So if you can find your way back to the work, then, uh, then you'll, you'll see that it has its own life. And, and children's books are the same as, as grown-up books. In fact, many of the children's books that are best known are grown-up books. So the principles of creation of the creative process are the same. A children's book writer needs to have a vision, uh, needs to have a story, needs to have a structure, needs to have a work life, needs to understand the nature of discipline, needs to understand the nature of their own resistance, and needs to have the courage to, uh, to carry her work through to completion. So the, the principles are the same, you know, the form is different, that's all. Okay, great. Let's take a question. Actually, there's two different versions of the question that every writer wants to know about getting published. <laughs> Susan first says, I'm thinking about the new trend of writers publishing their work, self-publishing. Are these works ones that have been declined by regular publishers? And then Virginia says, how do I publish or place in public the final work getting funded? Okay, well, those are both good questions. Uh, Susan, no, self-publishing doesn't necessarily mean that you were turned down. A good friend of mine, for example, just wrote her first book. She was offered a contract with a publisher that she wasn't happy with, and she chose to self-publish. And it's been the right path for her. It's doing very well. Uh, the money all goes into her pocket as opposed to getting a small royalty from a publisher. Uh, so there are real advantages to self-publishing. A lot of folks don't realize what a boon this is for creative people to be able to have these avenues, these platforms to put our own work into the world. So we don't have to worry about being funded by others necessarily. We, we can, for a fairly small sum, publish our own book on our own time, uh, with our, to our own taste. You won't have to take some publisher's terrible cover that you don't like. You'll be able to choose your own. You can choose your own typeface. Yeah, you can uh, you can decide how you want to distribute it or not uh, distribute it. So it, it puts the power back in the writer's hands. So self-publishing is is no disgrace. In fact, it's very very liberating. Some of the most creative uh, and successful people I know are doing it. And so I recommend that people not get too hung up on I need to find uh, a mainstream publisher for my work. That may happen, but if it doesn't happen, you no longer need to put your book in the drawer. You can put your book at, at Create Space and, and, and have a finished copy within three or four weeks. It's an extraordinary thing. The other day I, I got a wonderful memoir from a student of mine who looked for a publisher for a while and got sick of it uh, and was feeling like they were trying to direct her in ways that she wasn't happy with. So she wrote the book she wanted to. She published it beautifully. It looks completely professional. Uh, and I'm thrilled for her. And she didn't have to sit around for six months waiting for, uh, you know, waiting for an editor at a, at a big publishing house uh, to get around to reading it uh, in, in the slush pile. Or even if it comes in through an agent, it's going to take months and months to get a response. So take your power back uh, unless you are married to the idea of, of uh, finding, uh, an ex finding a publisher. Uh, and if so, then you can do that understanding that there are, you know, it's a slower process. You have less control, uh, and you will very likely make less money uh, unless you unless you write a, a bestseller, which I hope you do. Chances are you will do better financially self-publishing, which is a, which is a uh, a paradox, but it's true. 
You know, Eckhart Tolle first self-published The Power of Now uh, before finding a mainstream publisher. And that's the other thing that often happens. People are self-publishing, and then a publisher may pick it up if you sell a few thousand copies. Someone might uh, might like it and then take it on. So just because you publish uh, by your, publish it yourself originally doesn't mean that you, you won't be able to find a, a publisher later on who will take care of dist- distribution and all of that. Beautiful. Thank you. Let's do one last quick question here. Deb just posted this. Deb says, I'm registered for the course at a time when I'm going to be moving house. Do you have any tips on how to hold writing and learning focus in the midst of upheaval? Honestly, Deb, I wouldn't even try. Uh, I I wouldn't try. In, In the heat of moving, don't try to keep your focus on your writing. You won't be able to do that. And that's, that's a great example of what I'm saying about not creating uh, unrealistic expectations for ourselves. It's very unlikely. If you, Deb, can find 20 minutes a day in the morning or whenever you have quiet time uh, to, to take some notes, to journal a little bit, to, to muse, to think about what you're working on, fantastic. If you can't do that, know, understand from the beginning that it isn't some failing on your part and, and that you will get back to it seriously. Uh, in, a, in a few weeks' time, there's, you know, life calls. And when life calls, we need to listen. Otherwise, it creates untenable conflict around our creative work. We feel then that we have to make a choice, this or that. Uh, we end up having to choose our lives because we need to take care of them. And, and then the writing goes by the wayside. Okay? So don't set up that, that polarity, that conflict for yourself by expecting uh, that you can work through, through a major move. It, it's... Not likely to happen. All right, perfect. This has just been a wonderful hour with excellent advice. I want to thank our viewers for being with us today and for all of your questions. Once again, Liberating Your Authentic Writing Voice starts Wednesday, January 9th. And again, you can visit writingvoicecourse.com to learn more and to register. So before we cut you loose, Mark, do you have any final words for our viewers? I hope that you'll join me for this course. I'm glad that I'm doing it at the beginning of the year. It feels, it feels right with the spirit of beginnings, the spirit of fresh starts, uh, also the spirit of resolutions. I know a lot of people who are writers or creators of various kinds who have the resolution to finish what they, they started last year or, or the year before uh, in 2019. So I hope you will, will join me. This class will be a big help to you if you feel blocked or if you feel uncertain around what you uh, about your own work uh, and it'll be good to see you there all right thank you again mark it's just been such a pleasure talking to you today on video for once it's great to see you thank you <laughs> you too great to see you lisa all right once again thank you to everyone who joined us today on behalf of all of us at the shift network i wish you well and look forward to having you on this course or perhaps another one in the future Have a great day, everyone.